Warning, the following video will contain spoilers for Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and Future Connected. Minor spoilers for Future Connected will be throughout, and major spoilers will get its own section. But major spoilers from Chronicles 1 are unavoidable, so don't say you weren't warned if you decide to stick around. You know, the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 wrapped up pretty nicely for everyone involved, with one key exception, and didn't really leave much room for a direct continuation of its story. So you can imagine mine and everyone else's surprise when it was announced that the game's definitive edition would feature a new epilogue game that would take place on an area cut from the original game, The Bionis Shoulder. Future Connected, as it was called, was made for two big reasons. One was to hint at things to come for the series, hence the title, and the other reason was for this lady right here. The developers, like basically everyone who's played the first game, felt really bad for Melia, given that she lost nearly every member of her family she had, most of her race was turned into Telethia, and she never even got the guy she liked, so yeah, Melia had a whole lot of bad crap happen to her, so it's great that we have an extra story that will hopefully give her anything at all, really. So let's go ahead and see just how this epilogue game connects back to the future of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Let's get started. We the Taking place one year after the events of the first game, Shulk and Melia are traveling to the Bionis shoulder on Junks after Alkmoth was recently spotted hovering near it, but are shot down by a mysterious laser coming from Alkmoth that would later be revealed to be an enigmatic smoke creature called the Fog King, who looks very familiar. Like, I'm pretty sure I've seen him somewhere before, but where? Uh, you know what? Uh, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, it'll come to me at some point. One day, randomly, a rift in the sky appeared, and the Fog King with it, and because the thing's intangible, the High NT and Machina were unable to do so much as scratch the thing, forcing them to abandon Alchemoth. It's not too bad, though, since the Telethia are keeping it confined to that one spot. So, Shulk and Melia's current goal is to help the people of the Shoulder find a way to kill the Fog King so they can reclaim Alchemoth. Joining Shulk and Melia, though, are a pair of Nopon stowaways named Kino and Nene, who just so happen to be two of Ricky's numerous children. Upon hearing the notion of adventure, Kino decided to come along so he could be a hero pawn just like his old man. Nene, however, came along to keep Kino from getting into too much trouble. Why she didn't just stop him from coming altogether, I'll never understand though. I mean, it seems pretty irresponsible to just let your younger kid brother go on a potentially life-threatening adventure, but hey, maybe she thought it would help build character. We as you'd expect, Future Connected plays very similarly to the base game, but with a few changes, like the skill link and affinity systems being absent. Since Shulk lacks a real Monado, he doesn't get any visions this time around, which, if you ask me, is a change that, while I understand narratively why it isn't here, mechanically it makes Shulk's other Monado arts hard to use, like shield and speed. See, because you don't get visions, timing Shulk's Monado arts to counter an enemy's attack can be pretty difficult to do yourself. And the only defensive art worth using this time around, at least in my opinion, is Monado Armor, since it lasts for 15 seconds and does a great job at reducing all damage, especially if you upgrade it. Because of this, I decided to stick with the default character of Melia this time around, since AI Shulk seems to be able to handle his Monado arts just fine, and because, like I said before, Future Connected is more Melia's story than anything, so it really only felt right to predominantly play as her. And I just gotta say, why the heck did I not play as her more in the base game? She's an absolute blast to play as! Okay, so in the video I did on the base game, I made a claim that I thought One's combat was weirdly simple, and mid-editing I realized I never explained why I thought that. This didn't sit well with me, so let this video be an amendment to that, as well as why I think Melia is the most fun character to play as. One of the core reasons I find One's gameplay too simple has everything to do with the fact that there are a ton of things that you can keep track of that ultimately you won't ever have to worry too much about. The things like status effects on enemies and debuffs aren't really things you need to think about, at least in my experience. Combine that with the fact that you'll be using a lot of the same strategies throughout the game, and a lot of thinking on what arts you should use mid-combat kinda goes out the window. I can see why other people might enjoy this combat system over something like 2's, but for me it's not exactly super stimulating. With Melia's playstyle though, this sort of fixes that for me. Amelia's whole mechanic is her use of the elementals she can summon with her arts, each one granting a different stackable buff to the party when they're within range of Melia. When Melia uses her talent art though, she can discharge one of her elements going from last to first, the effect of which can range from damage over time in an area of effect, or just straight big damage. She also possesses the best topple art in the game, Starlight Kick. See, when used after Spear Break, it bypasses the need for break and an enemy's normal resistance to force topple, which is incredibly fun to do. I also just find the fact that Melia can dropkick an enemy as large as this Orluga here so hard she forces it to its knees. 
Clearly she was smart and never skipped leg day. Because of the wide variety of useful effects she can trigger and damage she can do, Melia actually gives me something to think about in combat. If I'm fighting a powerful enemy, do I want to prioritize water elementals for extra healing? Or do I want to prioritize wind elementals to boost the chance for everyone dodging? A formation I actually really liked using was having my second and last slots be fire elementals to boost general damage, and have my first slot be a thunder elemental so that when I discharge them they do more damage. Beyond characters themselves though, gems have gotten a bit of a simplification, and instead of refining them, Melia and Co are given various ether picks to just straight mine gems out of ether deposits. Gems weren't the only thing that got changed though. The chain attacks got changed as well, and instead of those we have the humble pawn specters. The pawn specters are a group of 12 Nopon who've come to survey the Bionis shoulder, but got separated along the way, and in order to recruit them, you'll need to do a side quest for them first. Once recruited, the Pawn Spectres will aid you in battle, and honestly, with all of these guys following Melia and Co around, they kinda remind me of furry Pikmin with hats. When you get one Pawn Spectre for each of their team colors, you'll unlock the ability to use an AoE super attack with them when the party gauge is full. Their blue super heals the party to full and grants temporary debuff immunity. Their yellow super forces days against any enemies in range, even if they have an immunity to it. And finally, we have their red super, which hits one enemy really, really hard. Similarly to the chain attacks, there is an element of RNG to them though. Sometimes when you use one of their supers, you'll get an extra attack, allowing you to use another one of their moves. I'm actually okay with the RNG this time around though, because honestly with how hard these guys can hit, frankly not having it be RNG related would be pretty overpowered. As a whole though, I think I like these guys more than one's chain attacks to be honest. As it is, this system couldn't support a 70 to 80 hour game like base 1. The heck, I don't even think it could support a 20 to 25 hour game. But honestly, I just have more fun with the Pawn Spectres, and a big part of it is because of just how charming these guys are, both in their interactions with the main party and in their attack animations. The Pawn Spectres aren't the only thing I like more in Future Connected though. Things like side quests are greatly improved by having all side quests come from named NPCs and for the most part having more interesting stories. Heck, in some cases you can even get a bit of character development in a few of them. My favorite one is the quest involving you finding 20 red item orbs scattered all over the map for a Nappa named Pororo. Reason being that you get a reward from her for every 5 you get, which encourages the player to explore the Bionis shoulder, effectively sort of fixing my problem with exploration in Chronicles 1. Honestly, the Bionis shoulder is probably my favorite area in the entire first game. It is a very diverse set of locations, ranging from the ancient ruins of the giants, to beautiful plains, to a forest filled with giant monsters. All in all, I had more fun on the shoulder than any other area in one. Uh, it is a shame the Collectopedia rewards kinda suck this time around though. Seriously, Valak Mountain Gear? I mean, why would I even use this? It's worse than my starting equipment. On the note of things being disappointing though, it really bugs me that Nene and Kino are literally just Ryan and Sharla as Nopon. I know it was probably done to save some dev time, and I can understand that, but it really sucks that they aren't more unique party members, because I love these two. They're just adorable. I mean, look at that youthful hope in Kino's eyes. This is a Nopon that'll go places as a hero pawn someday. On that note of the characters though, I really like that they made the heart to hearts, or quiet moments as they're called here, more like the ones from 2, where they're all voice acted and you don't need to have a random level of affinity to view them. If you find one, you can view it, simple as that, which is a very appreciated change for me. On the final note for the gameplay, let's talk about the fog beasts, because as enemies, these guys are actually kinda interesting. At first you can only encounter them in Alchemoth since they're confined to it. Thanks guys, you're doing a great job at containing the apocalypse over there. But after a certain point in the story, the rift widens and monsters that were previously normal and totally sane have become fog beasts and developed a nasty case of void rabies. Fog beasts are usually kinda high level but fight like their non-foggy selves, with one big difference. Riot Surge. When a fog beast triggers Riot Surge, they'll pull in any enemies within a certain range of them. And those enemies will have their level raised to be equal to the fog beasts so long as it's alive. For the most part, they're not too bad, but the fog beasts in Alchemoth can be kinda nasty since those guys are at weakest level 74, and if you're not careful you can create some pretty nasty situations for yourself. The only other thing I wish they did was have a few fog beasts that doubled as unique monsters. It could have made for a really fun challenge or even a cool super boss. This is where most of my praises end though, because unlike the base game, the story of Future Connected, Sure is something. Now, you wouldn't think a story about a princess helping her people by reclaiming her home from an alien smoke monster that appeared from a giant Sauron-shaped rift from the sky would be a little disappointing. And yet, here we are. 
You know what, I was going to start with the good first and end with the bad, but now nah, we're gonna reverse that so we can end this video off with a bang. So let's begin with, ugh, Galgar. I mean, I'm not even sure what to say about this guy. Poorly written, a villain that could have been easily cut. Frankly, Galgar's character can be summed up as such. He's just a racist nutcase. He's just some guy that hates pure-blooded High Entia since they can become Telethia, and because Melia's the future Empress and have Homs, he views her as some kind of Christ figure. But, or wait, would it be Zanza figure in this case? It, you know what? Doesn't matter. Why? Because he doesn't even matter that much to the plot. Literally, the only point in the story he matters is when he causes Teelan's house with all his research in it to explode, because he ain't exactly cool with the idea of turning the Telethia back into Hyentia, and then after losing a fight against our main group, he's chased off by a Telethia who is presumably Teelan's mother, and he's never seen again in the main story. Like, he doesn't even do that much to hurt Teelan's research progress, since thanks to Melia, he still has some of the necessary notes needed to continue his work. And with how long the lifespan of a High Antia is, Galgar accomplished effectively nothing. A year to a High Antia is like, what? A week? A month at most? Heck, he doesn't even get a narrative resolution in the main story. He only gets it in a side quest, where after a quick fight, Melia tells him off and encourages him to move on, but Galgar, being Galgar, decides, Redemption and attending for what I've done? Acknowledging that I'm actually a terrible person? Screw that! Ocean floor, here I come! Then we have the Fog King, and while I do like him more than the other guy, I'm still disappointed by the fact that at the end of the story, we know next to nothing about what the Fog King is, or even what the whole deal with the Rift even was. The only clue we have is from Shulk, who says it's probably because the world he and Alvis made at the end of Base 1 is still new and might be a little unstable, but that still does nothing to develop the Fog King as a creature in this world. If these things make a reappearance in Chronicles 3, I really hope they do more to build on these things, because the fog creatures are the biggest example of why I wish this game had a bigger scope. Thankfully, Melia and Tyrea keep this story from being straight up bad. Yes, after 10 years, Melia is given a much happier end to her character arc, with her reclaiming Alchemoth and taking her rightful place as Empress, with Tyrea at her side, since according to her, Melia can be uh, a little too soft. Yeah, Tyrea got some nice development after one, with her becoming the surrogate sister to Teelan after saving him from the Fog King in the past. And in the game's quiet moments, she even gets some moments where she and Melia talk things out with Nene serving as an uninvited mediator in one of them. As a whole, these are all really nice, and honestly, her and Melia kind of saved this game's story from it- Oh! Oh, I just remembered where I remember the Fog King from! He's a Goldo! What? Uh, no, not that Goldo! The one from 2! The boss Goldo from 2. Yeah, there you go, that's the one. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Infernal Goldo, a required boss from Xenomite Chronicles 2. Notice any similarities? Cause I am, and I have zero idea what to make of it. So, slight spoiler for two, skip to here if you want to avoid that in three, two, one. Yeah, the fact that this thing looks like a Goldo is very interesting, given that the Goldo are humans that were heavily mutated after a certain event in two, and the fact that these things look even remotely the same has a lot of implications. Especially if these things make a reappearance in 3, which I really hope they do, because wow are these things underdeveloped. To be honest, Future Connected was just alright for me. On a gameplay level, I did have a bit more fun than in the base game, but it lacks the well-written story that helps to make Chronicles 1 so good in the first place. Thankfully, it at the very least gives Melia a wonderful finish to her character arc, as well as one of the best major areas in the game with the Bionis shoulder. It's pretty short, so I definitely think it's worth at least one playthrough if you've already beaten the game once before, and one to see Melia get a relatively happy conclusion to her character arc. That being said though, next time we'll be covering Xenoblade Chronicles X. Is what I would be saying if Chronicles 3 didn't release a whole two months earlier than I expected. On one hand, the gamer in me is incredibly happy to be getting a new entry in such an awesome series earlier than expected, but the YouTuber in me is really frustrated because I was actually really looking forward to replaying X and seeing if I'm still disappointed in it years later. Someday, Xenoblade Chronicles X will get its due. But hey, this just means I get to play 2 next, and I have been really looking forward to making that video. So next time we return to the series, we'll be visiting the world of Allrest in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a nice day.